Hi, everyone. I'm Kyle Dyer, and welcome to Colorado Inside Out on this Friday, November 29th. Let me introduce you to this week's insider panel. We have Patty Calhoun, founder and editor of Westward. Penfield Tate, a Denver attorney and community leader who served in both the House and Senate in the Colorado legislature. Amber McReynolds, national election and administration expert and former director of elections for the city and county of Denver. And then at the end of the table, we have Sean Walsh, public affairs professional with Sean Walsh Consultants. The entire election year, we have been projecting forward about what will happen next, and we will do some of that uh, this week as well. But first, I'd like to start this show because on this day, November 29th, uh, we are looking back 160 years ago to what was the deadliest day in our state's history because the Sand Creek Massacre occurred on this day. 675 Colorado volunteer soldiers with the U.S. Army attacked Cheyenne and Arapaho people. 230 women and children were killed. This is a tough day in Colorado history, but it's an important day to remember as well. And it's a lesson into the impact of not understanding one another, prejudice and fear. Patty, I will start with you. There were native, natives living there, Arapaho and Cheyenne, and they believed they were under the protection of the Army. There had been a treaty done that September. They had a white flag flying over this camp. And Colonel John Chivington took the Bloodless Third, which were all the volunteers, and he'd, they'd been mocked because they had not seen battle. And basically then Territorial Governor John Evans gave them the right to go massacre these people, uh, to get rid of the nits, they called them the children, and the adults, and they raided this peaceful camp on the morning of November 29th, wound up killing mostly women and children and elderly. After brutalizing the bodies, they paraded parts of bodies, children they'd stolen, they paraded them through the streets of Denver. It's a horrible chapter in Denver history, which kids were never learning about in the school. What had been done, what had been done under the auspices, really, of the territorial governor. So 10 years ago, Hickenlooper, who was then governor of Colorado, had a Sand Creek commission. He talked to all the still living governors of Colorado, asked them if he should apologize on behalf of the state, and he did. And it was an incredibly moving time. And Hickenlooper will talk about how he talked to Richard Lamb, who was still alive then. And Dick Lamb said, the most powerful words we can possibly say are, I'm sorry, and you should do it. So 10 years ago, Colorado did stand up. Still plenty of work to do, but it was an amazing moment. Outgoing chairperson of the board at De History Colorado, which has a wonderful exhibit, Penn. Yeah. Uh, you know, I really encourage people to go see the exhibit. What's, what's unique and, and important about the exhibit is when History Colorado curated it, it did it over a period of years with the direct assistance of members of the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes. And parts of the exhibit are in their native language and tongue. So the tribes contributed artifacts to the exhibit. They also helped put the exhibit and curate the exhibit together. About the massacre itself, and Patty, you and Patty have talked about the details. There are a couple other things. As Coloradans and as Americans, we need to understand and know. Number one, when the massacre occurred, a lot of the leaders of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes weren't there because they were in Washington, D.C., because they had signed a peace treaty with the U.S. government, and they were there talking about how the different cultures and communities were going to coexist. There were two lieutenants as part of this who refused to engage and refused to murder these um, indigenous people and actually wrote letters to their commanders saying that their superiors should be reprimanded and punished because this was nothing but murder. And one of them, Lieutenant Sewell, was himself murdered on the streets of downtown Denver or Larimer for not engaging in the massacre. I think reflecting on our history so that we can build better understanding of each other, but also build stronger community uh, for all Coloradans and, and learn from the devastation of the past and the devastation that comes with power and aggression uh, in, in politics, which is, you know, I think this demonstrates yet again who gets hurt. It isn't necessarily uh, the, 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 the leaders within the military, but it was actually women and children that were left behind because of the politics and, and aggression of the day. Mm -hmm. John? You know, there's really two histories about the Sand Creek Massacre. One, of course, with the horrific events of 160 years ago, but there is a more recent history, a second history, um, 150 years later in how the massacre has been, was, was commemorated. Um, and it's in this second uh, 
period of commemoration, in particular how it was originally depicted by History Colorado. Um, and I think it, a tip of a hat to our co-panelist, uh, Patty Calhoun here, who wrote an article in, in 2013 that really precipitated and brought to light some of the lack of collaboration that the History Museum at that time had with the tribes and some serious shortcomings with the exhibit and how the tribes weren't listened to. Um, you know, that set in train, Patty's article set in train a series of events that, that has greatly enhanced how we, how we commemorate it today. Two, two months after Patty's article, uh, the exhibit was closed. A year after that, the governor officially apologized, as she mentioned, on the steps of the Capitol. And in that mix, the CEO and COO were no longer with the museum, and there was a, there was a new, new board uh, members that were appointed. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, not all of a sudden, but many years later, finally, an exhibit that did take into consideration all of the, the input from the tribes in a meaningful way. So to the extent that there's any good that comes out of it, Patty's journalism really has added and enhanced um, our understanding of that event and, and helps us commemorate it right in the correct way. And Sean's correct, and, and, and kudos to Patty. Um, History Colorado got it wrong telling the story the first time. And it, 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 I think it taught many of us a lesson that sometimes if you want to tell a story, you have to let the people impacted who were living the story participate in the telling of it. The original exhibit, which was when History Colorado opened, was like Disney goes to a massacre. It was really quite, you know, they were trying to be sensitive, but it was reenactments and noise and almost cartoon-like. What History Colorado has done is completely transformed its institution, too, yeah. and done a really stunning exhibit. So go see it this weekend. Right. It, definitely go see it, if not this weekend. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Well, communities across Colorado are all decked out in holiday lights now. And tonight, the lights were switched on at Denver City and County Building for Light the Lights. But there's been a wider spotlight on Denver over the last week after Mayor Mike Johnston said uh, the city would be mobilizing Denver police to face off with National Guard troops if President-elect Trump's plan for mass deportation happens when he takes office. Now, Mayor Johnston has walked back some of his initial comments but still getting a lot of attention, Penfield. You know, it is, and, and I wish, I'm glad he walked back his initial comments because he kind of went a little bit too far. Um, but I think he makes a good point. When you take a look at things, um, President-elect Trump made a big deal during the Dobbs decision of saying that what his Supreme Court, and he takes credit for that, what his Supreme Court did was put the decision on choice back with, with local governments in the states where it belongs. Now that he's got a different policy he wants to implement, he's saying, well, no, local governments, you don't have any say in this. We're going to tell you what to do, and if you don't comply, we're going to arrest your leaders, we're going to put people in jail, and we're going to punish you. I think Mayor Johnston was right to say, you know, this is Denver, and we're a home rule city in a, in, in a state we get to decide how we go about doing some of these things. We get to decide how we treat people who are resident in the state. And you don't get, God forbid, you don't get to send the U.S. military here, but you certainly don't get to try to demand that the National Guard tell us how to manage our own city and the people in the city. With regards to the mayor's comments, the voters are kind of tired of the politics that play out on Twitter with sound bites and fundraising and, you know, in, the, in this sort of aggressive um, back and forth, which uh, at the end of the day, ultimately who that harms are the, the constituents, the residents, the kids in schools, the families that are here, um, it, w when there's this sort of aggressive political posture and fight going on in the public domain. So I hope that all of our elected leaders are really thoughtful about how they approach the next you know, months ahead and years ahead with regards to this issue to make sure that that citizens and constituents and, and communities in Colorado are prioritized as opposed to sound bites, fundraising, fights in the in the political domain because I think I think just that the electorate has expressed deep concern and frustration with with the politics that have been uh, spinning in this country um, on various platforms. And now we continue to see our community in the news again, again, and again. Uh, well, so many angles on this topic. I mean, to the suggestion that's been floated about uh, removing the mayor from office, uh, the only way to do that is by a recall 
election. Um, and it, the last time any citizens group attempted a recall of a mayor, it was, it was unsuccessful. It was in Federico Pena's second term, never even went to the, to the ballot, the, the effort failed. I can't think of a more counterproductive, inefficient, ineffective way of bringing the mayor to heel than to initiate a recall effort. He's very much in his element campaigning. Um, he's, I, I think an effective indictment of any politician has to be about something they did, some kind of pattern of abuse, uh, something you know, that they actually did, not something they said they do. And I think for all the Fox viewers out there, be careful what you wish for. On that same ballot, you're electing a new mayor. And in deep blue Denver, you might get a progressive who's even more willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the president. Mm. All right, Patty. The biggest problem Mike Johnston made was to perhaps find an image that was a little over the top, talking about this would be like Tiananmen Square and that Highland mommies would be lining up along the border. That was probably going a little far. The fact that he wants to say we're a home rule city, we'll take care of our own. Legally, you have no position to come in, to have the feds come in on U.S. soil to fight citizens. And a lot of the migrants who are here are here legally under asylum or they've got their green cards. We have no indication of how Operation Aurora would actually work. And would people be, would they distinguish between people who are here legally and people who are not? So until we learn something more about will there be mass deportations, Will there be any legality involved in it? I'm sure we're going to continue to hear these crazy Fox News bites like Tom Homan, the border czar, saying he'd be happy to send Mike Johnston to jail, and which it, I think would make him very popular, Mike Johnston, not Tom Homan. And it's also local people, like Sean was saying, who are on Twitter saying he should be taken out of office. All right, one way or the other. Okay, as we close out this month of November, let's take a look back one last time at what transpired on the 5th with a look at some post-election analysis, not about the races per se, but what we have learned about voters. Amber, I want to start with you on this topic. More than a third of voters, a little over 80 million people that were eligible, did not vote in 2024. Um, that is always the stat that I think is one of the most important to come out of an election. Why didn't this great number of voters, I mean, that's more than either presidential candidate got by far. The largest block of voters in Colorado by far is unaffiliated voters. And that has grown even more from 2020. It's been growing over the last 10 years. Um, when you look at primary turnout, which also has an, a, a relationship to the general election, only 25% of Coloradans voted in the primary in about 80% or so of uncompetitive districts. So when you look at our turnout being down, a lot of that has to do with the lack of competition, the lack of engagement. It also can relate to the fact that we didn't have a Senate seat. And then the very long ballot. I think that that, that actually does have an impact. Um, and so it would be great to consider things like maximum word counts on uh, ballot uh, language and issues for the future. Sean? In terms of what it all means for 2025, the Democrat finger pointing has to, it will stop at some point. It has to because we're going to be heading into a cycle where city councils are voting, school districts are voting. And if you look at history, if you look at the last time, the first cycle, the first odd year cycle after Trump was elected, Progressive candidates on school boards, in particular in Douglas County, and on city councils, like Aurora City Council and in Littleton, were elected in the next cycle. So uh, it remains to be seen what the outcome will be, but if history is any, any, any guide, 2025 should be a year for progressive candidates. You're very tapped in. Are you starting to hear about any possible campaigns? Uh, in 2020, not yet. It's not still yet. a little bit early. Too early. Still, too much finger, too, still too much finger pointing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, finger pointing at pollsters, which I think we can mm. say we're not going to pay as much attention to next time. Just going with my gut, I thought RTD would squeak by. I did not think it would be get the endorsement it did just because they've been so in the news for their problems. But since Chris is not here, I can say I love the initiative process. I love it that citizens who are not happy with what their legislature is doing can push to get things on the ballot. And I also love that you saw... People really picked and chose. They were able to analyze what they liked on those initiatives, on that really long ballot. They were able to decide which made sense, which didn't, and vote accordingly. So you saw a lot of probably very split decisions on some of those. But in general, it was a great citizen outcome 
for all the ballot measures. You like the citizen outcome, but you think it's too much and overwhelms the citizens. <laughs> well, I think it's good for the citizens yeah. to weigh in on on these very important topics. I just think that we could we could shorten the, the questions and make them easier for voters to consume well, and read. And 131, for example, I don't know how that got around the single subject issue because you had the primary change and then you had the ranked choice voting change. It was too much. I think voters might have gone for some of that, but it was long, it was confusing. Hmm. You know, I think all of this speaks to a need somehow to figure out big picture change. I, I think one of the most important things that was said during this conversation was Amber's point that 80 million people did not vote. Did not vote. More than either presidential candidate got. What that tells you is the level of I'm fed up and I've had it has reached a point where people are just opting out of having a voice in their own futures. And so people tend to opt out of the process in large measures and I think that's the danger about democracy. It can be sloppy. It's important. We need it. But it can be sloppy. And we need to, I think, clean up part of the mess. People are expressing aspirationally what they want their community to be. They want transit to work. And I've been as big a critic as RTD as anybody else on this show when I've said I think it's the most dysfunctional government in the state of Colorado. But people want it to work, which is why they pass their ballot measure. And so... I hope that elected and appointed officials understand when people vote and approve things, they're really saying, please figure this out, get your acts together, mm -hmm. and let's make society work. Mm -hmm. and, and I would add on what Penn just brought up, the system itself is disengaging a lot of, a lot of portions of the electorate. Colorado, we have great voter access laws. It's easy to register to vote. It's easy to participate. That's not the case in a lot of states around the country. And so when you see states with 50% turnout, while we have 80% for active voters, that is the system. It's policies that, that are disengaging the electorate. I think one of, the, you know, one of the issues that we, or two of the issues we have to continue to work on in Colorado is the fact that we have very few people participating in the election, the primary, that decides 80% of the seats. We, we don't have co competitive seats. And so one in four voters decided most about 80% of the seats in Colorado this year. Um, and, and, and we have got to get that better. All right, Colorado students and teachers had some time away from school this week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And it was a good breather amidst daunting times and the announcement to close schools in Denver Public Schools and in Mesa County. Douglas County is considering closures as well because of declining enrollment, which is also an issue now at the University of Denver where the budget is being made a little bit tighter. And there's also the concern about funding when it comes to the state budget in 2025. And then, of course, what will the federal government, the federal Department of Education, look like under the new administration? There is a lot involving education right now, Sean, yeah. and a lot of challenges. Well, sure, and de you know, declining enrollment, we have to admit now, is a thing. It's not an anomaly as we were hoping it would be in previous years. There has been you know decreases in in, in, in enrollment over the last four years. Um, it there there is a trend, and it's going to continue. And it's so s strange for those of us that have been around for a while that remember, you know the unending growth. We were only going in one direction there, it seemed like, for 20 years. And now things are leveling off. I think uh, 1,800 fewer K-12 through K students uh, enrolled this year compared to last year. Okay, um, And there, there's so many factors. Um, people are getting old. Colorado's getting older, right? That slice of the demographic that's 65 or older will double in the next 30 years. And people are getting older healthier. That is, they're aging in place. They're able to stay in their homes longer than previous generations did. A lot of parents are opting for homeschooling for their kids or online learning. Fewer people are having kids. Fewer families are moving into Colorado. And there's so many downstream. It's, it's, so, it's so downstream of some other things that are happening in Colorado with inflation, the cost of housing, gasoline, insurance, you name it. I mean, people, uh, it's, it's, we've, we're, in a, we're in a trend here. Um, and there are financial implications. Obviously, the per pupil uh, funding depends on uh, depends on the number of you know uh, depends on attendance. A hundred kids, uh, you know, a fall off of only a hundred a hundred students. That's over a million dollars for a district. That's impactful. But as much as the financial impact is significant for the parents, really, it is. It's an emotional one. 
um, you know, having it's a, it's a traumatic thing, and it really does reduce student performance if they're not able to go to the school if they were counting on going. Mm -hmm. Well, you do wonder what would happen in Denver, Pub uh, Denver Public Schools had they had the whole closure discussion and named the schools before the election, but instead they waited until after the election, giving the families just two weeks to deal with it, which seemed a little chicken to me, but it is really hard, as Sean said, for these families and their kids, and it is only going to get tougher. We did an interesting story about the state demographer who's retiring, and she's saying, so it's not just that the birth rate is down and the schools are going to have to close because there are not as many kids. You go up, next it will be high schools that will have to close. Then you go, the workforce is smaller. You don't have these kids growing up into the workforce. So Colorado now has 1.5 jobs for every single job applicant. And it's a problem just going from a big boom state to maybe one that's getting busted. Hmm. You know, it, it. this is another one of those big picture things we have to figure out because uh, educating young people is the best way to sustain, sustain your society and we've got some issues there. One of the things we have to face is we've got declining birth rates in this country and in this state. There are fewer little kids growing up, going to school and going through the system and Patty's right, there's going to be a ripple effect. Um, the attendance in DPS is down 10%. I think over 14 years, it's down 40% in Douglas County. And so as young people are marrying later and delaying having kids or not having kids, the school age population is shrinking. This also ties into another issue, which is immigration. And, you know, we need to be mindful of the fact that a number of immigrant kids are in our schools because we fund based on seats in the classroom. And so it doesn't matter if you're here um, documented or not. If you're in the classroom, you count toward the pupil count for a school district. And so that's going to change the financial viability of school districts as well. Well, I have two of the little kids that are in middle school. Um, they're at different middle schools, so I spend a lot of time driving around uh, Denver. And I would, I would just add that I think that we have to really think through what does the strategy look like going forward and, and why, yes, birth rates are going down, yes, there's dynamics like that changing, but I would also contend that the schedule even of the school day was never designed for working parents at all. I mean, picking kids up at 315 or 325 or 4 or 4, I mean, that, that all is counterproductive to what a work day looks like for most people that are working. Um, and so I think it's also what, what, are the, what are the schools offering in addition to the school day, the sports, the after school programs, what does the whole structure look like? And do parents want to have options that are closer to work for them? Like it might actually be easier to drop kids off closer to where parents are working, whether that be downtown or in the tech center or other parts of the uh, state, as opposed to the community that they live in. You know, and that's something for me, at least, that uh, is a big issue. So I think we do need to reimagine what the school environment looks like, given that the, the dynamics of working parents and, and the home life has changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about some of the highs and the lows from this week. We will start on the low points, so we can end on a high note. Patty, I'll start with you, as always. Save yourself some time this weekend. Do not watch the Netflix series on John Benet Ramsey. It is a real turkey. You have seen it. I have. All three parts. And you still don't know who did it. No. <laughs> right. I have my suspicions, but you won't get anything from this. So, yeah, it's interesting. Is it going to come up again? All right. Yeah. Um, disappointed to see that the city of Denver basically shut down the Five Points Jazz Festival. Um, I understand they're going to give grants to community-based organizations. My fear is the grants will be so small that they won't have a meaningful impact on the organizations. There's something to be said about a community and neighborhood celebration, and the jazz festival will be missed. Right outside our doors here. Right outside our door. Mm -hmm. Amber. Aggressive and unproductive politics. That's my low. That's it. <laughs> okay. We'll go with that. That encompasses a lot <laughs> and a lot of people. So regarding the painting recall, the number of signatures that's required to get, uh, to get a, a, recall petition, a recall question on the ballot is 25% of, of who voted in the last mayoral election, so 25%. In 1988, that number was 39,000. It was 39,000 signatures. Today, it's 41,000 signatures. So even though we've had all this growth, 200,000 people moving here in the last 36 years, 
Talk about low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. In the mayor's race, it's even worse. Voter turnout has plummeted. So, uh, I mean, imagine now, and then it's so much easier now to vote than it was in the 80s and 90s. The ballot comes to you. Imagine someday when we're voting on our smartphones and turnout goes even lower. Hmm. The easier we make it for people, it doesn't seem to, to work on turnout. Yeah, it seems like that. All right, let's talk about something positive. Get off those smartphones tomorrow. It's Small Business Saturday. Go shop at a local mom and pop store. Love it. Will do. You know, in, in my career in the legislature, you deal with a lot of people, um, including folks in the lobby. And we lost a wonderful lobbyist recently. Diane Reese passed away recently. Um, she was wonderful. She was smart. She was engaging. And she's someone you could take her word. When she told you something, it was gospel. Like She'll that. be missed. Uh, two things. So November is National Diabetes uh, Awareness Month. So that I, I always want to draw attention to that um, particular issue and encourage people to learn n more about, especially type one that that is in juvenile uh, and what a lot of kids face, um, but also support the organizations that um, do gr good work on research uh, in supporting that community. Okay. Kudos to Adams County School District 14. In 2018, it was taken over by the State Board of Education. Four years later, they fought back against a reorganization and just on November 5th, passed a bond and a mill levy. So a, a big a boost of confidence from the voters of a very economically challenged community to finally give them a chance to buy air conditioners and pay pay teachers accordingly. Okay, good. All right. Uh, my high is an easy choice. Both my girls are home from college, and I'm also grateful to have everyone under the roof for this, even just through the weekend. Uh, but also, since we're just following up on Thanksgiving, let me extend deep gratitude to everyone who is a part of this show each week, all of our dedicated behind-the-scenes crew, our super smart insiders who come in once a week, and to all of you watching or listening to our podcast. I'm Kyle Dyer. I will see you next week here on PBS 12. PBS 12 believes in the power of original, local programming. Help us bring more shows, like the one you just watched, by donating at pbs12.org slash program support today.